When you do common things in life in an uncommon way, you will command attention of the world. That's a quote from George Washington Carver. And what better way than to start off a conversation in August during National Black Business Month than with the president of Carver Bank? Hello, everyone. This is Jabari Young, senior writer here at Forbes. And in a minute, I'll be joined by Michael Pugh. He is the CEO of Carver Federal Savings Bank, based in Harlem, one of the largest black-run banks in all of the country. And we're talking all things black business because, again, it is National Black Business Month in August. Why consumers and businesses should choose Carver and the state of the economy when it comes to black households. All that and more with Michael Pugh, the CEO of Carver Federal Bank. When you're a CEO of a bank, um, I figured it's hard to turn off your phone, though, right? Oh, yeah. It, it, listen, I don't think this phone has been turned off in, uh, since I started at Carver. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> 11 years ago, starting at Carver, you That's haven't turned right. off your phone. Set, but you turned it off for me, so thank you. My pleasure. It's I appreciate good. it, man. Listen, happy National Black Business Month. Uh, and and any goals for the bank now that we're, we're officially in, in business month in August? Yeah, well, so I think it's probably worth saying that um, every day for Carver is about celebrating black businesses and entrepreneurs yeah. in general. Um, but especially for this month, August marks an important time because it presents a, an opportunity for us to encourage our customers, our community to support minority businesses, to support black businesses. You know, earlier we were talking and we're headquartered here in Harlem. And so every year around this time in the next couple of weeks or so, uh, one of the biggest deals that will happen in the state of New York and uh, we'll get a lot of media impressions will be Harlem Week. Mm. And Harlem Week is all about encouraging black businesses uh, to uh, remain strong, grow and sustain. It's also an important time where, you know, we promote overall health and wellness for our customers and community in general. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really special time of the year, but it's uh, it's a day in the life of a community banker. Yeah. Well, listen, man, so much to get into. Thank you. I'm looking forward to Harlem week. I mean, that sounds like it's going to be exciting. And I can't I listen. I can't lie. I, I may get in trouble for this. But for me, just as for me. Black Business Month, I think is it, it's my favorite month out of all the black holidays and the months we get in, in the year. Right. We got after your know, black history month. And mm -hmm. we always we know that the commercial around that. And I feel just for me, Michael, Black Business Month is my favorite one I, I, for me. That's just for me. Tell me you're on my side, please. I'm on your side. Thank you. Side. All right. Good. They, they ain't going to be they ain't, ain't going to mess me up for other. Hey, man, listen, <laughs> when you think of black, you know, business month, I I, I I only found out that this month even existed only a few years ago. Um, and, and I don't think, and even to, I tell my friends that today, people still don't know that there's a month dedicated to supporting black businesses. But yet here we are in 2023. Do you feel that the momentum behind Black Business Month, or not even behind Black Business Month, but behind Black Businesses, period, has died down post George Floyd? Sure. So I, you know, I think the momentum of, regarding Black Business Month, there's still more opportunity to get the word out there yeah. right um but the broader and more important issue that you're raising is the momentum in terms of supporting black economic development uh, and i would i would submit that it has changed a bit as some of the as some of the energy that uh surrounded uh, the horrible death of george floyd has um, time has passed us now. And so uh, I would submit that as the time is passing, people have gotten a little bit away from understanding the overarching intent was to raise awareness and ensure that we are all doing the right thing in terms of supporting uh, racial equality within mm -hmm. this nation. It is not a black and white issue. It's an American issue. And specifically for small businesses, there continues to be an important need within black businesses to help them have access to capital. And so that's part of our mission and the story that out there is to make sure that as a, a socially responsible community development financial institution, CDFI, which is a U.S. Treasury designation for Carver and uh, the sector as a whole, 
we reinvest 80 cents of every dollar that we have on deposit in the communities that we serve. And we do that through economic development, access to capital, financial education programs, and a number of other critical things. So CDFIs are playing a really, really important role at, at a national scale, challenging our communities, our community leaders, elected officials, to be ever more aware that black businesses play an important role in this nation. And the biggest thing that we could do to help them is to ensure that they have access to capital and resources. Yeah. I mean, listen, over 200 uh, billion in, in, in annual revenue driven, you know, according to the you know latest U.S. census. Um, no, no question that black businesses play an important role in, in helping the economy uh, overall. Your perspective as a whole, though. Right. And, and we I think we agree that the momentum has died down a little bit. Um, how we pick it back up, right, is a, is a different conversation. But when you look at, you know, National Black Business Month as a whole, right, if, if you had to, like, pick one word to describe the feeling of it now, right, and again, there's still a lot of awareness to get out, what would you say that is? Um, I, I think it describes, I think the way I would describe it is it, it presents an opportunity for uh, uh, community and um, being good citizens. Yeah. Um, from a community standpoint, supporting local businesses. We know that, uh, especially within uh, uh, small businesses that are defined by the Small Business Administration, these are typically businesses with 500 or less employees. However, when you look at the typical black small business, you're really talking about 20 or less employees. In some cases, significantly much let more uh, much lower than than 20 employees and so these businesses are important within our communities because they play an, a role supporting the tax base they add jobs to communities they play a role in the overall economic development and growth of, of neighborhoods block by block so that sense of community is very very important to make sure that we are all uh, leveraging this month to create awareness about the importance of small businesses, black businesses. We're getting out there, we're buying their products and services. And I think that's a way from uh, being good citizens that we can uh, ultimately help. You know, you heard me earlier say it's not a black or, or white issue or a race issue in general. It's an American issue. Mm -hmm. And so the moment that we start thinking about how do we play a role in supporting the economic development and growth of businesses, minority businesses especially, we really then start to solve an important issue for our country, which is closing the wealth gap and improving the overall GDP for the nation. Yeah. yeah and we'll get into the wealth gap and generational wealth. Uh, definitely want to hear your term around that. Uh, uh, and, and a little bit, but hey, listen, you, let's flash back a little bit. Um, you grew up in Detroit, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Detroit, I Michigan. Yeah. I, I had a chance to go up and really dive and, and visit that city, you know, in the inner city downtown last year. And there's a special place about Detroit, right? It's an energy there, creativity there that it's hard to describe. But when you go there, it's almost like, hey, you know what? Something is going to happen. I'm going to think of something. I might come up with some design, like, but there's this that energy there, man. What was it like for you growing up in Detroit? What did you want to be like? What was like life like for Michael Pugh up in Detroit in those, in those years? Yeah, well, you know, it seems like it was a lot of years ago for me, but I would tell you it was a special time. Uh, and uh, there's- What years and, around that? What, what years were you coming up around? What years were those? Well, so so I grew up in, you know, I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. in Detroit, Michigan area, and of course in the 90s as well. Um, and uh, just, of course, by nature of that question, it, it really makes me sound a bit older than I, I, I want to give myself Well credit. developed, man. There's no such thing as old. Well developed. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but it was a special time if you consider that um, the manufacturing industry was doing relatively well, you know, Detroit, Motor City, and so the automobile industry being the most uh, predominant uh, sector that was driving the economy. And so what we saw was a lot of middle income communities, people of color, uh, black people that were in middle income um, uh, status with home ownership 
and being in many cases, the first or second generations of their family to own a home, uh, to be able to achieve some level of uh, financial independence. And it was, a, it was a great time to uh, experience it because again, you heard me talk a little bit about just the sense of community as well. It was a period where as a kid, if you did something wrong, you didn't have to worry about your parents finding out. It was more of a question of when they were going to find out which neighbor was going to tell them. And in most cases, you'd already gotten a good lecture from that, that neighbor to ensure that you were, on the, uh, you were on the right path. So what I learned was to truly appreciate and understand the importance of what uh, black middle-income communities could look like and how they could thrive but I also learned some really important things in terms of financial education, uh, tools and resources to ensure sustainability. So as you know, Detroit is now ex experiencing a renaissance uh, of its own again, after having really experienced a significant plight. Mm. Uh, a substantial number of, of homes were vacant, the population uh, greatly declined, and the overall infrastructure just took a real beating within the city. And one of the biggest reasons I think is that because uh, so much of the way of life was, was built around almost one or two sectors in terms of industries and the communities themselves, frankly, were not given or didn't have all the tools and resources to um, plan for financial independence beyond having that great job on an assembly line or within the automobile industry. I remember times where, you know, we would, at, when I took my first job as a, a teller at a bank, we'd have customers come in, they'd get their bonus, and that bonus might have been as big as $10,000. And I tell you, they would take that cash, in some cases, out all on the same day and wow. uh, to spend it. And, yeah. uh, so not know, saving the, or anything like that yeah. or investing in it, but but right. Yeah. But understanding the understanding the impact of how if you could save, would well, understanding the the benefit of thinking about uh, taxes and insurance and other ways as part of your overall uh, wealth building uh, strategy. So yeah, uh, yeah. 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 So you're saying it's drawing, going through Detroit, you know, you, the automobile industry is booming. You could have done anything, right? You could have played sports. But I, I read also you were interested in healthcare because you had a lot of family members who were in that sector. You decided it wasn't for you and you went into banking and finance. What kind of sparked that other than being at a teller and counting all that money? And you're like, you know what? I want some of this. But what else <laughs> kind of sparked staying and being in standing in finance? Yeah. I So for me, I think the biggest thing was that coming from a, a family of healthcare providers, the conversations that happen at the table oftentimes were really centered on uh, wellness and care, and come, patient care, and how to help uh, patients just in terms of the, their care. So hearing those conversations so often, you know, mm. hearing my mother with her friends that worked with her coworkers on the phone and they were talking about patient care, I knew that there was definitely kind of a, a paradigm for me that I would play a role in some form of wellness. And I also grew up in an environment where it was very much uh, reared in terms of thinking that our part of our purpose uh, being here is to make sure that we do some good and we help others. And so uh, what I learned actually just from working in the healthcare field for a short period of time as a physical therapist assistant while putting myself through college is that I was a little bit too close to the reality of life and death by mm -hmm. being in the healthcare field. That did not feel like my calling at, uh, at a young age in my early 20s. However, when I got the job as a part-time teller, um, and uh, continued to work my way through. The biggest thing that I saw is that when customers were at the desk and they were talking to an advisor that helped them with their first mortgage, student loans or debt consolidation, uh, any of the milestones that you can consider 
they all need some form of uh, capital, right? And so to see the look of relief on family space when they were able to get that approval for uh, whatever that major milestone that was going to be happening, I knew I wanted to be a part of, uh, of some form of care. And to me, it looked and felt like the care was being provided through financial services. So yeah. I doubled down on learning as much as I could about the healthcare industry, uh, excuse me, the, the, the financial services industry, because that was my form of uh, my way of being able to play a role in wellness and care. Yeah. And you saw the dollar signs, too. Come on, man. I mean, I, 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 <laughs> we had to see the dollar signs. But listen, you go from Citizens Bank, right, and, and you end up at Capital One, uh, and then you get the position where you are right now at, uh, you know, Carver Federal uh, Savings. Now, guys fund uh, the African-American community, the black community, Caribbean community, um, and, you know, real estate as well as uh, business loans uh, is predominantly, you know, what you guys do. Traded on the NASDAQ, if I'm not mistaken, a market cap of about $12 million, right, if I'm not mistaken. Um, am I missing anything with, with Carver? You, you've got it. You've got yeah. it. Yeah. Headquartered in Harlem, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, what's the narrative around black banks in, in 2023? Well, so I think the narrative has, it, the narrative has changed a bit. But in order to address that question, I think it's also important to understand the history. Remember, Carver was founded back in 1948 by a group of community leaders, civic leaders. These were faith-based you know, organizations, not-for-profits, uh, small business entrepreneurs, all middle-income people of color that did not have access to financial services because of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. Hard to imagine that. And stay there with me for a second. The idea that you actually have money to put in a bank, but just because your your skin complexion is brown, that you wouldn't be allowed to bank at some some financial institution. And so these pioneers did something about it. They decided to get together and form their own financial institution. They named it after George Washington Carver because you know he is definitely the essence of. Uh, pioneer inventor, right? And uh, they created something that still stands 75 years later. This year, in fact, marks our 75th anniversary, and we're That's very right. proud to be here. And we think we're playing a role in change in the narrative because the narrative in the beginning, during the height of the civil rights movement, and perhaps up in, in, you know, uh, into the 70s, was that institutions like Carver were very, very important because it was the place that understood our community and and stood behind, stood beside our community when they needed us. Catching them when they yeah. would fall and standing by their side to ensure that they're standing up straight and have the support needed. Yeah, Of course, yeah. as then the much larger financial institutions then decided to become much more interested in banking um, uh, across all ethnic segments. Um, we then saw it become a line of business for a lot of our larger financial institution partners. And I think it's important for us to say um, that a lot of that narrative is now changing because what we've learned is that access to the bank that's on every corner isn't the same as having a relationship. During the pandemic, uh, we saw nearly 40% of black businesses that were at the brink of closing their doors or did in fact close their, their doors. These, uh, these are uh, small businesses, by the way. And these businesses, in many cases, attempted to go to larger financial institutions and ask for their help and just simply wasn't able to get it because um, of the competition in terms of additional volume uh, going to the, those same financial institutions. When it came to institutions like Carver, Carver played a very, very important role in supporting many small businesses navigating through the pandemic. At a national scale, we supported more than 16,000 small businesses with access to capital and more than $300 million in access to capital at a national scale. And in New York City alone, more than 400 businesses with more than $50 million in capital to them. 
And the important part about that story is 5,000, nearly 5,000 jobs were preserved within the great state of New York alone. And so what, what it says is that we have to remember part of our history in the past. Part of the whole social construct of, in terms of being able to grow and thrive means that you must have relationships. You should be able to reach someone when you need them that can help you navigate through tough times. Having access to your banker versus a bank branch that might be on every corner is a very different thing. Your banker having the ability to, and the authority to help you navigate during a tough time is very, very important. And that's the story, that's the narrative that we think we are uh, building today. And many of the uh, minority deposit institutions, CDFIs across the nation are building because what we're saying is, while we don't necessarily feel that we're in a position to compete with the bank that's gonna be on every corner, we are here when you need us and we are going to be responsive and you have access to some of the most senior people in the institutions to help you navigate through times, good and bad. Yeah. Well, man, listen, you, you motivated me. Maybe I have to come to Carver now, open up an account, you know, because you're absolutely right. The relationship is there. I've had a relationship with my bank since I was, you know, yay hot, because, again, my, maybe my, my parents didn't introduce me to a black owned bank. But again, as I continue to gain knowledge as a journalist now, I, I'm more you know excited about uh, that possibility and maybe not making the same mistake. And now having one for my daughter, you know. But let me ask you, what's it like to be the CEO of a black owned bank and just a bank period. What, what's that role like? It's humbling. It's humbling and it's extraordinarily rewarding. Uh, it has been the highlight of my career. You know, I've been in uh, I've been in the financial services industry now for more than 30 years. And Carver uh, happens to be a publicly traded bank. So if you consider that there are about 4,500 financial institutions uh, in our nation, roughly uh, 13, approximately 13% of them happen to be publicly traded financial institutions. Yeah. Carver Federal Savings Bank being one of them. And what that means for us is that we ultimately, uh, we have a responsibility to drive shareholder value, but we also have this responsibility to deliver on our mission and always remember our history, which is that we are a premier community bank designed to support uh, minority and business entrepreneurs so that they can grow and thrive. And we are financial first responder when our community needs us, we're here. And so when you think about those, those important points that I, I just shared and understanding that in my role, I've got to play a really important part in being visible in the community, yet continue to also tell our shareholders and investors why their investment in Carver is really actually making a difference. Earlier, you heard me say 80 cents of every dollar that we have on deposit gets reinvested in the communities that we serve. That approximate 80 cents is a number that far exceeds many financial institutions and what it ultimately means is that we are playing a role in the transformation of communities and lives on a daily basis. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Absolutely. Yeah. Sticking with the theme of, of National Black Business Month, you know, listen, I was excited to hold this conversation with you and I even went. Uh, we have a community here we call Forrest BLK and I asked them, hey, listen, if there's anything y'all want me to ask the brother, let me know. Um, and, and there was a sister who, through our Slack channel, she sent me a very insightful uh, question. And, and I don't want to misquote her, but the, the, the general point of it was is that, listen, if we can agree, right, that entrepreneurship, is, is entrepreneurship has accelerated pathway to wealth creation and we accept that black entrepreneurship is rapidly expanding, right, why hasn't the economic position of black America advanced? I thought that was a very powerful question. I'll leave it to you to, uh, to answer it. What do yeah. you think? I, I, think it, I think it's a complicated question. It's a great question that, that actually has a complicated response, I should say. Um, it's tied to history. It's tied to the need for uh, a better understanding today. And it's tied to the call to action for all financial institutions to play a role in the most important thing, which is access to capital. So consider this about 
40 million Americans uh, today uh, don't have a credit score that is uh, that would qualify them for traditional financing from a bank. Mm-hmm. And that's based on the traditional methods that we use for looking at credit scoring and credit worthiness. So some of the work that we're doing at Carver includes looking at non-traditional uh, scoring components. We're looking at things like whether or not you've made your lease payments on time or your rental payments on time. Are your utilities being consistently uh, paid on time? And then building an overall credit score, if you will, based on those alternative uh, things. And so what we then understand about that is uh, if we can help a customer to get access to capital because they've demonstrated some credit worthiness elsewhere that isn't hitting the, the traditional radar, we now can get them on that traditional radar because the loan that we, the, the affordable loan that we provide to them is going to be reported to the credit agency. Yeah. And combined with that, aligning tools and resources, uh, tools and resources through the public and private sectors. So reaching out to organizations to help ensure that financial mastery, understanding how to build a strategic plan for your business, how to ensure that you understand the income statement and the balance sheets and what it tells you, how to create uh, you know, overall partnerships to improve your, your distribution. All of those things are ones that we're doing through partnerships with organizations. So it goes beyond just getting the access to capital. It's once you've got the capital, then understanding how to leverage it in a way that ultimately will grow your business. But we're, you know, we're a hyper-local community bank that is trying to make an impression on the world. And I think the call to action is that we need more. Uh, we need more financial institutions to be thinking about and, and helping to address this issue. Because again, it goes back to If we help small businesses, black businesses grow, we will ultimately help our nation thrive. Yeah. Again, is it support the economy, right? And GDP, as you as you kind of mentioned, a few more things. And I I definitely want to, you know, get let you get out of here, because, again, you're the CEO of a bank. So your phone's probably uh, you you got a lot of messages coming in. Your phone's (laughs) off. But I'm sure you got a lot of messages coming in. Um, You know, one of the things and I'm reading your, your, you know, Carver's 10K report. And I understand, you know, uh, females, uh, women are, you know, make up of the majority of your employment uh, or your majority of your employees. how do you kind of attract more black men to get interested in finance, right? Because you you know you don't want to leave that generation behind of future financiers. How do you kind to how to motivate them uh, to to enter the world of finance and and into that sector? Because it looks like it's very thriving. Yeah, yeah. Well, so diversity and inclusion is a really big deal for our organization. Yeah. Um, it is not one that we just talk about it because it's uh, it's a popular topic as opposed to understanding the importance of ultimately being able to grow your business best by having a broad uh, a broad level uh, of thinking and experiences that are all at the table uh, to ultimately support the organization. And so what I would say, you know, in many cases for, you know, specifically for black men, um, we we have a number of programs, for example, through historically black colleges and universities. We have reached out. We're working very closely with an organization called uh, Society for Financial Education and Professional Development. And this ambassador program allows us to work with HBCUs where we go in and we uh, we hire student ambassadors that provide financial education to their peers. Those student ambassadors are receiving um, the edu- financial education tools and leadership under the supervision of a certified financial planner. So young black men being one of the important groups as part of th- this whole uh, experience playing a role in providing financial education to peers there in in the classroom. And those peers then um, get an opportunity to see black men in leadership uh, capacity. They also get an opportunity to learn more about uh, smarter financial management and then starting to think even broader about 
careers in the financial services sector, because once you start to open the book and you provide the, the, the education, you demystify some of the components about whether or not the jobs, the opportunities to have a career are achievable. They, they certainly are achievable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, looking at the uh, economic outlook now, man, listen, you're a banker, so I got to talk to you about it. Right. Your advice to black households. What are we looking at? You know, the Federal Reserve, the Chairman Jerome Powell, he came out and said the banking, uh, the, the, the sector is fine and stable. Um, but real estate, as far as especially from the commercial side, still a little kind of you know it, volatile, it feels like, you know, especially as, you know, the work from home environment continues to spread. What are we looking at? What is your advice to the black households, especially as 2024 is right around the corner? Yeah, I, I agree with the chairman. I do think that at a national level and certainly uh, the way that the Treasury looks at uh, uh, economics is that uh, the environment seems relatively stable for now. The nuance that I would perhaps offer is that I think within uh, minority communities, we have typically seen um, issues show up first and become much more exacerbated. And so while we won't necessarily have time for today's discussion to, to fully dig into this, I would, I would submit to you that the wealth gap issue uh, in our nation is becoming exacerbated by rising interest rates environment. And for small businesses, especially uh, many of the black small businesses, just simply because of their size and the uh, lack of capital that they need, they will continue to experience the margin compressions associated with rising interest rates. And those, mar those compressions basically uh, put more pressure on the operating expense and the, the, the sustainability of their business. It's a matter that we will all have to pay very close attention to it. Uh, we, we know it's in our best interest for uh, small businesses to have the opportunity, the chance to thrive. We know also that for many small businesses uh, across our nation, they rely on their credit cards as a primary way to, uh, to pay for some of their operating expenses. And so financial institutions have a responsibility to come up with affordable ways, again, to help with access to capital that doesn't drive a, a, an entrepreneur to use their personal credit card at a much higher interest rate. And so what you heard me talk about uh, earlier is some of the lending programs that we, we've uh, we've put in place. These are Those are just examples where I think uh, our CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution peers, and uh, larger financial institutions across the nation have to keep thinking about. Last thing I'll add to this is that for any entrepreneur that's out there, um, if, they've, if they're listening or when they listen to our discussion, and if the first this is the first time they've heard about CDFI's Community Development Financial Institution, a call to action is to learn more about them. Because under the, the guidance of the U.S. Treasury, we have a very different scope and remit, and that is to help support historically underserved communities, entrepreneurs, small businesses, so that they have a chance to navigate through tough times like this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it sounds like that, in, especially again, as we bat round out 2023, enter in 2024 and, you know, interest rates are still high and maybe we get to a recessionary period that if you're a small black business, black business period, maybe mid -size, that they can come to Carver and, and get help with with capital. Absolutely. And so you know, should they look there first? They should certainly look at institutions like Carver and other CDFIs, community development financial institutions across the nation. There's CDFI banks, there's more than 100 and, uh, 140 CDFI banks across our nation. And they have assets under management of more than $120 billion. These are CDFI banks that are in rural communities, big cities like New York or LA. So in short they're everywhere and they are available and they understand 
the nuances, the needs of small businesses. Absolutely. Come to Carver first. We want to take care of you. Now, listen, man, I told you I'm, I'm going to come there for my daughter. I'm going to get that open that savings account because of the simple right. fact that you, you're schooling me. <laughs> hey, man, uh, two more things. I'll let you get out of here. And uh, these are rapid ones, right? Uh, the first is, is that w w we always talk about generational wealth, right? That term is thrown around a lot nowadays and we all want it. We all, but uh, I'm asking, okay, what does that mean? What, how do we get there? What are the pillars that we have to, what, when you hear that term, generational wealth, right? Especially when it comes to the black community, what comes to mind on what we have to do or what people have to do to make sure we achieve that? Yeah, so the first thing that comes to mind is the ability to pass something on to the next generation within your family so that they could, uh, they'll have a better opportunity above and beyond what uh, the, you might have had, right? But pass but one they, on. I could pass on a dresser and, and they'll be, you know, it got to be worth a lot of money. What, yeah, do, what no, should I, they I, make sure that they need to pass on? Something, something along that is of value, significant value. And so the way that we typically do that, if you think about the history of our nation, it's through home ownership, it's through equity in a business, it's it's through valuable uh, goods and services, things that we've we've had. But the ability to pass the, to pass value, to pass equity on is really important. Now, the important part is, okay, how do you do that, right? And so you do it through understanding the importance of things like equity within your small business. How do you, how do you take that business, you allow it to grow? And that means that you might be on the payroll and when you pay yourself as an employee of your company versus drawing all of the assets and all of the, the value out of the company just to support your lifestyle. Um, you understand better and you think more about taxes and how what are some of the tax structures and things that you could put in place to help ensure that your family uh, is well positioned for the future. And insurance, and I think specifically for insurance, uh, a lot of times, especially within uh, black households, insurance has often been regarded as more bur burial insurance versus part of a wealth building strategy. So once you start to learn more about the fact that you could actually have a pretty substantial life insurance policy that could get passed on to your family um, and, and really help to protect uh, their, their uh, financial health and wellness for, for long term, those are things that uh, are all uh, could be put in place. And so we, we just have to make sure that um, we, we have to make sure that we extend our arms, we get out there and we tell people what they need to know to start achieving that, uh, yeah. that generational wealth. Yeah. And my final thing, you're a black business or you're a black individual and you may be looking for your first mortgage or you're looking for that, that line of credit uh, that's going to help you expand. Um, and you're seeing this and you're like, hey, you know what? I like Michael Pugh. Um, why should any black individual who have are not customers of Carver all of a sudden become a customer of Carver? What do you sell them? What's the one line that you tell them of why yeah. they should make a switch? Well, so let me just say, I think our doors are open. Well, I know our doors are open for everyone. Yeah. And what I would say is that I would want a customer, regardless of their race and background. I want a customer to choose us because they understand that we will be thoughtful and committed to their financial wellness. Um, specifically for black businesses and uh, customers of uh, people of color, I think it's important that you support a, a financial institution like Carver because our history uh, is very much connected with our 75 year presence today. And that is grounded on the fact that we are financial first responders. We will be there for you through the good and bad times. We've demonstrated that in the work that we've done, educating more than 16,000 people over the past few years, financial education and small business workshops, more than 5,000 jobs being preserved, uh, uh, during tough economic times uh, over the past uh, a couple of years, and more than $80 million in capital uh, being provided to women and minority uh, small businesses throughout greater New York City. Those are the kinds of uh, things that says, you know, no pun intended, we're putting our money where our mouth is. And, 
And so if you want to play an important role in terms of helping to ensure that your neighborhoods remain strong and your communities could have a chance to continue growing, coming to a bank like Carver sends a powerful message that you are part of the solution and you are committed to growth in communities of color. Yeah. Michael Pugh, appreciate all the time, my brother. Thank you so much. I appreciate the education. Happy National Black Business Month. And listen, I hope to have you back to continue the conversation, especially as we go through these economic times. I think it's important to understand the state of the uh, black community here. Again, at Forbes and Forbes BOK platform is definitely the place to talk about and to do it. Look forward to continuing that uh, discussion, that insight. Um, and, and now you can go turn your phone back on. All right. Thanks for your time today. <laughs> Thanks, man. Take care.